Our speaker today is a man that we know is one of us. He's, been, he's ministered here severally. His name is Peter Ondeng. He's married to May Ondeng. They are blessed with two sons. And Mr. Pete is a leadership coach and a strategy consultant. Why can't you help me put your hands together as I bring Mr. Pete to the pulpit? Maybe you can uh, introduce the wife and then we'll be blessed together. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, I want to take this time to thank you for the speaker. I want to thank you for his life. Lord, your people have given tithes and offerings. I want to pray the Lord as these tithes are used to build the kingdom of God, continue to expand this ministry. We also pray for Anne and the family as they mourn. Lord, you'll give them strength. Lord, as we sit to hear from you, speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Buona sefiwe. Well, um, before I do anything, I want to introduce you to my wife and just ask her to stand up, May Ondeng, and just wave at you. She's over here. We thank God. Last month, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> You're supposed to be clapping and saying hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't say we've been married for 50 years. You see, I'm an economist. And I have discovered, as I look at the rising cost in our society, and I talked to my wife and I thought, by the time we get to the 50th, the cost of holding a party is going to be so expensive. Let's go ahead and celebrate it now. And, and get it. <laughs> we had a wonderful time. So when we get to the 50th, we don't have to do anything. <laughs> Praise God. I am so excited to be back at uh, Sitam Kisumu. Um, and I, I, I truly thank uh, the senior pastor and attacker, Pastor Ibrahim, and the pastoral team, the elders, deacons, and particularly the men today. Um, I was so blessed by the ministry during the worship. How many of you really were blessed? Some of you came late, and you don't know what you missed. And um, I've just been prompted that I'm going to ask them to come towards the end of the service to prepare yourselves. The song that I really ministered to me and I think is so relevant uh, uh, to what I'm going to be speaking about is, uh, what's the name of it? I'm even forgetting. Kuakamawewe, <laughs> is it? Yeah. Nikujue Zaidi. Nikujue Zaidi. I'd like you to come and minister that at the end of the service. But what I want to do is just to, to take a few minutes. We could, don't have a lot of time, and there's so much that I want to share with you. And I'm going to try to, imp, to, to just compact it into the short time we have. A message on Father's Day. A message for Father's Day. It's not just a message for fathers. It's a message for all of us. But I want to use... God's attributes of fatherhood to speak to us about what his expectation is of us as fathers. Because God, above all else, is our father. It is interesting that when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he could have said, Pray like this, our creator, and you know he is, or our healer, or to say our deliverer, which he also is. But he said, 
I want you to align yourself like this when you pray. You pray to our Father who is in heaven. And I have often asked myself is what is God's design? What is God's um, plan or desire for fathers? What is his plan and template? And I, I realize as I seek and I read and as I was preparing myself, that God has laid out for us the model and himself as that model. So please bear with me as I share with you three attributes of God and I'll very quickly just give them to you and then I'll break them down one by one going into the scriptures. The first statement that I want to make is a principle that is God is on your side. God is on our side. I'll explain this in a minute. Number two, God has a wonderful plan for you. God has a wonderful plan, not just a plan, but a wonderful plan for you, his child. And number three, God has the last word. Praise God. God is on your side. When I was young, much younger, I used to love to play soccer, football. I know many of you like to watch football. Many of you go crazy about football. I was a football player. But do I say? And I was not just a football player. I was a goalie. I was a goalkeeper, as short as I am. And let me tell you, I wish we had video cameras and little phones back then so you could see how I used to play. Because how I used to dive and how I used to, I mean, people would say I'm like an acrobat. A ball is going this way and I'd flip and you'd see me flying with my legs up in the air. And I did, I looked really good. But there's only one problem. I could never stop the balls from going into the net. And as I played football, I learned the importance of knowing who is on your side. You need to know who is on your side. Whether it's the coach shouting at you from the sideline, whether it's the man over here running towards you, is he for me or is he against me? In life, we have a lot of things that work against us. This is a fact. People who are against you in your own family, people who actually work against your success, colleagues who you work with, you wonder what is it about these people who are working so hard against me? Every step I take forward, it's like they're just preoccupied with pushing against me. Let me tell you, as you go through life, you're going to experience forces that are against you. Things that are going to work against you. Jesus promised it. He said, in this life, you will face many tribulations. Don't kid yourself. But he didn't stop there, did he? He said, be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. Jesus said, I am on your side. I'm working for your success. I'm not here to condemn the world. I'm here that the world might be saved. I'm so aware that when I speak to a congregation such as this one, we all have different experiences. There are people sitting in here who don't know the Lord as their Savior. Probably many. There are people here who are crying because of something that has happened at home this morning. There are people who are grieving because of the loss of a loved one. Somebody is sitting here trying to figure out why is it that I've had to go through this series of accidents and issues for the last few months or weeks. Let me tell you this morning as a starting point that God is on your side. God is on your side. 
And I use this attribute to try to bring it down to what God expects from me. As a father, but also as an elder in society, in my community, people look up to me and have a need to know that I am on their side. I know there are many families here who have gone through crises, issues. Some of your children have gone through things and you don't know where the rain began to beat you. Your children need to know that you are on their side. I speak not as one who has already attained. I am on a journey just like you are. We make mistakes. We trip. We fall. Just like we saw in this little clip that we saw here. The fathers are human beings. But we come before a holy God who is gracious and who is merciful. And we say, Lord, help me to take the position that you take with me. You who are on my side, help me to know as a father, as a parent, that your call to my life is to reach out to others. Think about it. That Jesus, when he was asked on various occasions about what is it that is required of us, he would simplify it and actually it's like he would point in two directions. One up and one sideways. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor. Work with the one that is next to you. And especially today as we commemorate Father's Day, do our children know that we are on their side? The scripture that was read this morning in Romans Romans chapter 8, the first part of it says, what, in uh, 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? There are a lot of people I wish were on my side. But let me tell you, if God is on my side, there's nothing that can stop me. And that is what the Lord is telling us this morning. In verse 32, he says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I cannot underscore that more, and even if we were to stop this sermon here, just to walk out of here, to go home and meditate on this one principle. God, my father, is on my side. He's on my side. I may not understand the journey I'm in. I may not understand the things I'm going through. But I know this for sure, that God is on my side. Amen. Principle number two is that God has a wonderful plan for you. God has a wonderful plan for you. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says... For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good. Or in other versions, it says plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Did you know that God is a planner? A lot of times we think of God in many different ways, but do you know God has a plan. I work with organizations and many times I sit with a CEO or a team and we talk about the plan for the next five years. And I can assure you that if you don't have a plan, then you are really just subject to any wind that comes along your life. And one of the things that we fall on, and I speak as an African, is that we, as a people, are generally not planners. We don't plan. We don't plan our lives. We don't plan the lives of our children. We, don't, we live from crisis to crisis because it is somehow how we have been oriented. God has a plan. Do you know some, more, some of you here 
will spend more time planning a funeral. Hello? You'll spend more time planning a funeral than you will in planning your life. More time in planning a Christmas holiday than you will in planning the lives of your children. Because somehow we have developed a, 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 a mindset which is ungodly. This fatalism. And we justify it. Let the will of God be done. Inshallah. Let whatever happens will happen. God will bless. It is interesting here that God has a plan for your life. And he has a wonderful plan for your life. And that plan is being worked out. The only problem is that, like with organizations that I work with, we can spend a whole weekend retreat and come up with a plan. <laughs> and then they go back to their offices and they live completely different from the plan. It is not enough to say God has a plan. The question then is, are we living according to that plan. Because God's plan is perfect. And I know from human eyes, when I walk out of the gate here, and I see a young tuk-tuk driver, or a young lady behind a small box or stool selling sweets, or maybe somebody begging on the street. In Nairobi, near where we live, there's a, in fact, a guy I've passed many times we would refer to him in normal general conversational terms as a madman. I pass him and I see him sometimes lying on the ground, sometimes leaning against something. I don't know if he's drugged out. I don't know what his situation is. And I have asked myself, God, do you have a plan for this man's life? The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. God has a plan. There is nobody who was born by accident. God has a plan for all of us. And he expects me to work according to plan. As a father. God has a plan. And you'll find that many of us will live our lives in a way that we go from birth to death without ever having even an inkling of what God's plan is for us. You know, um, if, if some of you watched uh, the television program, um, it's called the Leadership Forum on NTV a few weeks ago. I was, we were discussing, I was there as a guest along with a panel of people discussing leadership. And in that program, we began to talk about Africa. And one of the people there was, was uh, going on about, we need to stop talking about the negative things about our continent. And we we're all sort of nodding, yes. Africa has a negative image because of media, we're going on and our tourism is collapsing because we keep portraying the wrong stories. And I listened to this and suddenly something struck me. I said, wait. You know, in the interest of writing a new narrative on Africa, let us not bury our heads in the sand and forget that we have some real issues to deal with. If your child has malaria... Positive thinking is not going to solve it. Panadol is not going to solve it. Are you with me? If your child has malaria, you need to get to the root of the problem. You need to deal with that problem. And too many of us are living our lives doing things that pacify our feelings, remove the fever, but leave the disease. Sorry, I, I want to dwell on this just for a minute before I move on. But in this country of ours, you know how we have clamored and struggled to try to find something that will transform us. For years, we spent time struggling over multi-party politics. 
We need to get away from dictatorship. We need to be free to vote for who we want. And so finally the law was changed and we had a multi-party system. And then we discovered that the nation hadn't changed because the people had not changed. <laughs> Politics remained the same. People still rigged. People still did what they did. Only now they had many parties to do it in. So we began to struggle again. We said what we need is a new constitution. A constitution that will overhaul our whole legal system, frame our, our governance structures and redo how we live together. Lo and behold, we got a new constitution. <laughs> Only to discover that what we got was a new document. But the character of the nation remained the same. I don't know how many of you look around and how many of you are now beginning to clamor, what is the next big thing? And God is saying, I want to transform your land. I want to transform and change your community. But transformation is not about a highway being built. Transformation is not about computers being given out. Transformation begins with the transformation of the heart and the minds of the people. This is where we are serving Panadol instead of the medicine, whatever people use now for malaria. God wants to transform us. He has a plan, but somehow we're willing to take the easy road, take those things that will somehow get us to feel good rather than follow that narrow path that he has laid out for us. I'm calling on fathers. Be planful people. Plan your lives, plan for your children as God plans for us. Let's plan for good and not for evil. And if we have slipped in our words, if we have slipped in our actions, if we have slipped, God is gracious. He can correct our course. And on this Father's Day, this 21st day of June, if you can mark this, that this was the day I got on my knees and asked God, help me to correct course. That on that day, I realized that God is on my side. Number two, that God has a plan for me, a wonderful plan, as a father. And in the same way, he looks to me as a parent and says, live so in the same way. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans for prosperity and for a hope. Number three, God has the last word. This is where sometimes we get God wrong. Where because of God's grace and his mercies and his love and his patience and his long suffering, that sometimes we take God lightly. Because he is gracious and kind and patient, does not water down his firmness on right and wrong. God not only has a plan, he has an end game and he's not going to change it because of circumstances. My son, Brian, that's my second son, he's now 20 years old, a few weeks back, was watching a documentary and was puzzled by something. And he said, Dad, when Jesus was here, he healed many people. He would pray for people, demons would go, they would become well and they'd stand up. And then when he was leaving, he told his disciples, you're going to do these things. And then he left and guess what? They started doing those things. Then he said, what happened <laughs> between then and now? It was a valid question. A valid question from a young person who's saying, has God changed? What are we dealing with that God says, I will do this, and he doesn't seem to do it? 
The Bible tells me that God does not change. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know, and I can tell you for a fact, in my, and I don't mind confessing to you, my own weakness in faith on many occasions. I don't know how many times I've gone to a hospital to pray for somebody. Brother Pete, come and pray for so-and-so is sick, really sick. And I go and we pray. But you know, I'm praying because that's the right thing to do. I'm praying not because I expect this person to stand up. <laughs> and in fact, I tell you, if the person did stand up, I'd probably take off running, you know. <laughs> because we do not see God as having the ability to do what he did in the past. God doesn't change. His word, he has a final word on healing. He has a, let me tell you a testimony. We had... My wife and I hosted an American family, a couple. They're missionaries. Missionaries of old. I say of old because these are the missionaries that you used to read about. People who followed God wherever he led them. They've been working in the Tana River area for I don't know how long. The children have grown up. They continue to work there. They are actually ministering to this Muslim community. They have been attacked. They've gone through so many things. But in this process, God has revealed to this man that I want to heal people. And so he has taken God at his word. And he's going around praying for people to be healed. And he says, this is not me. And, and so he, he gave us a testimony as we were sitting in the house about a pastor in the States. They have just come back a few months ago. A pastor who had gone through multiple accidents, multiple operations. A man who lived with pain. You know people like this. People who just live with pain. And you say, God, why is this person alive? Painkillers don't do it. And he's trying to pastor a church. And then after all these, his final operation, he happens to be in a shopping mall He's walking onto one of these escalators, you know, these stairs that go down. And somebody's handbag gets stuck on something and he yanks it. And as he yanked it out, it hit him and he goes tumbling down to the bottom of the stairs. And this time it was that it's over. I mean, there is nothing really, another operation. So this missionary is explaining to us that he was called, he came to pray with them. But I suppose maybe they were expecting a, just a prayer, Christian prayer. And he said, you know, is there any reason why God would not want to heal you? You ask. Everybody who came to Jesus was healed. They brought their sick and he healed them. Jesus didn't do abracadabra, everybody in Judea and Samaria be healed. No, he healed and touched those who came to him and they were healed. He touched them and they were healed. And when he left, the power that he gave to his church, his people, to do these things and even more. So he explained how they prayed for this man and he told him, you're going to be healed now. They prayed, he called some people, they laid hands. The man stood up and the pain was gone. And as he began to walk around and began to do all these things, he bent over and his wife is saying, hey, stop, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, still thinking, go slow. The guy said, no, it's gone. It's gone. And so he's narrating this story to us in our house. My own wife, May, whom you've just seen, had an accident some months ago where she cracked her back. Has been going around with a corset, one of these braces, told this thing is going to heal over time. Bones don't heal quickly. So she decided, I want you to pray for me for healing. The man looked at her and said, and it was 11 o'clock, 
God doesn't worry about time. He says, my sister, is there any reason why God would not heal you? And you know, sometimes there are things, you know, things we harbor. Sometimes it is unforgiveness, some hardening of our hearts, things that we are holding that are keeping our prayers from being answered. And he says, is there anything God is revealing to you now? Deal with it. If there's somebody you need to forgive, forgive them. And she confessed some things and she said, I want to be healed. Let's lay our hands on our sister. And we did that. I wish I had time to go through and to tell her, get her to come tell her own testimony. We finished praying and she was healed. I am a very logical person. God created me that way. Forgive me, Lord. But as she began to say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm thinking, let's wait and see. <laughs> and she went on, she slept, she picked things up, she actually was restored. God has the final word and he does not change. He's not changing and he's there, he's saying, what is it that is holding you from trusting him? But you know, the plan that he has for us is a plan that is a perfect plan. And the things that we're going to go through in this life are things we are not going to fully understand. He says in verse 28 of Romans, which, which we read already, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I don't need to understand why she broke her back. All I know is that it works for her good and for good. Because she loves the Lord. And that's what he's calling us today. He's saying, listen people, I am on your side. I am your God. And then he says, I have a plan. And it is so sad and this is something I won't go into deeply. It is sad and I think one of the tragedies of life is that many of us will go through life not taking time to listen to God and come to the end, the final day, which Paul refers to as the day of Christ and discover that the journey you lived, the meetings you went to, the churches you started, the good things that you did that were not in God's plan are a total waste. You know, when you take an exam, sometimes you get an A or a B, yeah? <laughs> when I say God has the final word, listen to this. God does not say, okay, I'll give you a B, even though you disobeyed me. <laughs> he doesn't say that. I'll give you a C for effort. He says, on that day, many will come saying, Lord, Lord. And he will say, what? I never knew you. Depart from me. But, but we did so many good things in your name. Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not do this and that in your name? He will wipe them off the table. And he said, I had a plan for you. And I heard the pastor talking a little while ago about those of you who may be hearing God talking to you and calling you in a certain direction, as only he can. Because he says, my sheep know my voice. You have a choice to take the Panadol. You have a choice to do that which will satisfy your social standing. You have a choice to do that will, which will make you feel good or make you the money that you want to make. And God says, I am gracious, I am patient, I love you, I have a plan, but I have the last say. I have the last say. Friends, let us turn to God. Let us turn to God who not only started 
everything, but we'll finish everything. Um, please come up. I'm going to finish with this little story that somebody told me once. It's a story that actually speaks sadly about the lives that so many of us are going to, going to experience. It's a story of a man who was a musician like these young men here. A talented, gifted musician who was waiting for his day, the day in which he would be able to somehow display his talent and be able to do that which he was, he's been preparing himself for. So one day, his day came. The day of the concert in which he was invited to come and play with world-class musicians. The day his whole life had waited for. The day he had planned and prepared for. And he walked into the back room and meditating and polishing his instrument, taking it, taking it apart, putting it back together. He had his uniform on. He was waiting to be called. And finally, somebody walks into that room and he says, John, what are you doing here? John looks up and he says, I... I'm waiting for the concert. And the man looks at him and says, John, but the concert is over. The concert is over. The biggest tragedy in life, if you ask me, are the people sitting in this congregation right now who will live from birth to death and go into their graves with their music still in them. Is that going to be you? Are you going to walk according to your plan, according to your calculations, or are you going to walk according to God's plan?